beautiful God with something is beautiful. What a beautiful God with something. Hallelujah. The angels bow before Him. Heaven and earth are toy. What a beautiful God with something. What a mighty God. What a mighty God.
Mm. We declare that you are the loving God. We are seeing you in the scriptures, my God. Even as we go back, my God of oh Father, to see you from Genesis, my God. We are seeing how great you are. We are seeing how marvelous you are. We are seeing how righteous we are. You are seeing how a just and true God you are. Even as Moses said, I will ascribe righteousness unto my God. Lord, we ascribe righteousness unto you. We declare that you are a just God. You are a true God. Perfect in love, Lord. You deserve the glory. You deserve the honor. Even as it is declared in your word that great and marvelous are your works of loving God. Just and true are all your ways of loving God, O oh Father. Who shall not fear you, O oh Lord, and exalt your name? Who shall not fear you, O oh loving God, O oh Father, and bow before you? Lord, in fear, in trembling, yet in love, we exalt your name to the Father. We magnify you, Lord. We declare that there is none who can be likened unto thee. We declare that there is none who is like you. You deserve the glory. You deserve the honor. And you deserve all our praise. God we serve what a glorious God we serve what a faithful God we serve the more you know him the sweeter he becomes the more you know him the sweeter it is to praise him the more you know him the more it is sweet to worship him how glorious is our God even today this is a new day he deserves the glory. He deserves the honor. And he is yet doing a new work even today. For his word says, his mercies are new every morning. Hallelujah. I just want to greet you this afternoon. And I say, praise the Lord. Shalom. I believe that the Lord has been good to you this week. We have already entered into the fourth day of this week. Just a few days and we are soon entering into the weekend. And I just want to bring greetings from you to you from our trumpet mission and from Dr. John Melinde. And we want to say we love you. There is a team of people here praying for you, lifting you up before the Lord. And we are so glad every time we come online and we find you here. How much we love you. May the Lord bless you. And I just want us to go straight into the word of God. I want to thank all of you people who are giving in to stand with us as we are trying to finish up to build at least a mini studio where we can, we can have some, at least some good gadgets where our online service can become better and better. Remember, we are soon going to begin the JM Academy, the Academy of World Trumpet Mission. Some of you already people, you are in the orientation of the academy. But we want by the time when we begin the training, the coaching of the academy, that we have better equipments. And we just want to thank you so much, people. You're not giving in those who have already given. We know that you've not given because you have excess and things to waste, but you're giving in because your heart is for the kingdom and you're doing the will of God and you're sacrificially giving in in such a time like this. Beloved, Dr. John Melinda really appreciates all your gifts and we all say as a team, we are so grateful. Please, whatever the Lord has put on your heart, continue to stand with us. One day, we are all going to come to that place where we have a better online. You know, that's where the world is going. There are things that are not going to go back. We have come on online. We are going to stay and we are going to continue to minister unto you. Let's pray that it will go on until when Jesus comes back. You're becoming part of our family. We are becoming part of you. And as the Lord allows it, we shall continue to minister to one another. 
praise the good Lord. Hallelujah. Uh, we have been talking about so many things which I cannot recap even right now. But just to go back to what we have been talking about. Yesterday evening, some of you who were in the service, Apostle John Melinda was sharing about walking in intimacy with God. And then we saw Enoch, how he walked with God and he disappeared. And he was sharing with us his life what it takes for us to walk into that place where we are intimate with God, where we are in love with God. And we saw the things that we ought to do if we are going to be able to live in that kind of life. Praise the Lord. We are on this journey together. And we are all seeking this one thing. We want to come to a place where even in this season that we can know God more and more. Praise the Lord. But I was meditating and I was thinking in my heart and I was like, Lord, what are some of the things that hinder us to walk with you? What are some of the things that make it really impossible? That even when someone wants, sometimes we walk for a season, we walk maybe for days or we walk for months, and then all of a sudden we find ourselves drifting away. I don't say that I'm going to say everything, but what I feel in my heart to share with you today is what I'm going to be sharing with you. What really hinders us to come to that place where God wants us to be? What are some of the things that the enemy uses to hinder us to come into the fullness of what God wants us to be. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Let me request you that we go into the word of God. And what I want to talk about today, let us go in Luke 17. The book of Luke, chapter 17. And we are going to begin from there. From what I want to share about all what we desire is that we may have vibrant altars all that we are looking for is that we come to that place where we walk in communion with God. We want to know God, but the issue is, why is it so that sometimes we fail? And why do, is it so that sometimes we want to go further with God, then we find ourselves that we cannot go as far as we want to go? Let us go in the book of Luke chapter 17, and we are going to read from verse 1 up to verse 4. And the Bible says, then Jesus said he unto the disciples, It is impossible, but that offenses will come. But woe unto him through whom they come. It were better for him that a millstone were hanged upon his neck, and he cast into the sea, than that he should offend one of these little ones. Take heed to yourself. If your brother trespasses against you, rebuke him. And if he repent, forgive him. And if he trespasses against thee seven times in the day, and seven times in the day turn again to you saying, I repent, thou shalt forgive him. One of the things that hinder us to continue in fellowship with the Lord, beloved, it is offenses. When we get offended, offenses, this is one of the weapons that the enemy uses so much to quench our love to discourage us, to make us to fail, to walk with God in the place, or to come to that place where God wants us to be. I was, I, I, was, I was looking into the dictionary and I wanted to clearly know this English language is not for us. And I was like, what does it mean for someone to be offended? What does it mean to come to an offense? Jesus has said, offenses will surely come. So he's saying, he's not saying that a show offenses may come, but he's saying, I tell you, offenses will surely come. And because offenses are surely going to come, this is a weapon that the enemy is surely using to hinder us to walk with God, to frustrate us, to discourage us, that we do not come to that place where God wants us to be. But when I looked in the dictionary and I was seeking for this word offense, the dictionary says, offense it means to cause a person to feel hurt, to cause a person to feel hungry, to cause a person to be upset by something said or done. To be offended it means to be unpleasant to someone or something, to offend someone. It means you've done something to them which is unpleasant or you've said something to them which is unpleasant to them. And then the dictionary goes ahead to say, 
Offense, being offended or to offend someone, it means to do wrong, to be against what the people believe in is acceptable or proper. So that means if I have my standard of what I say, this is what I believe in, and then you come in with something which you don't believe with me, you, you're doing something which is not acceptable to me, you're doing something to me, it is not proper. And what happens? I get offended. What does it mean to be offended? It hurts me. I get hurt, I get hungry, I get upset. And that is what it means to be offended. And let me tell you, beloved, to some of us, offenses begin when we are still in our mother's wombs. Some people were offended, even the environment that they were in when they were still in their mother's wombs. It wasn't a good environment. So some kids are even born, the babies are born when they're already offended. Praise the Lord. Even when we are still babies, when we have not even learned how to separate right from wrong, inside of us there is a wisdom, there is an understanding that we say this is what has to be done and it has to be done like this. And then when things are not done, even when we are still babies, we don't even know how to articulate or to speak, we still get offended. Have you ever seen a baby when the mother has a little child? Maybe this kid is just even one month or two months. And then the time comes when the baby wants to drink or wants to feed on the breast of the mother. And then the mother is busy. And the mother knows it's time to feed the baby. And the baby begins to cry slowly by slowly. So he's telling the mother, please come and feed me. I'm not feeling well. Because the language of the baby is crying. So he cries a little bit and then he keeps quiet and you don't turn up. He waits and then you don't turn up. And then you say, mm -mm, I want to finish these dishes before I can come and attend to you. Or maybe to some of us you say, I want to finish these two chapters of the Bible before I come to you. And then what does this baby do? He increases the volume of the crying. He's telling you, mm -mm, I'm not here anymore. Please come and do it. Praise the Lord. And if you continue and you say, mm -mm, I've determined I'm first going to finish what I'm doing and then I'll come to you. This baby will begin to cry. He may begin to kick the bed. He may begin to kick the bed sheets. What is he saying? He's saying, I'm hungry. I'm frustrated. Uh, you're supposed to be here to attend to me. Can you imagine this is a baby? But he's telling you, you're supposed to come here and attend to me right now. Sometimes I've seen mothers when they have the baby. And then you pick that baby after he has cried for that long. You put them on the breast now and they refuse to take it. You bring the bottle, you give it to them, and they refuse. So now they are telling you, they are like giving you a command, never do this again. When I cry once, I want you to come here and attend to me. And then there are some kids when you know they're in that month when they have this milk teeth. It has begun to come. You've taken so long, he has cried and cried, and now the baby is hungry with you. He feels his heart because you've not come in time. He has his standard also. And then you put that baby on the breast, and what does she do? She bites you. I've seen mothers giving these little slaps and saying, never do that to me again. Never bite me again. But it was, this baby is is revenging, is even using the, he says, I can't slap you, I cannot speak to you, but I'm going to show you that I can also do something. You put it, you put that baby on the breast, and then it bites you. So you begin to see that being offended begins when we're even still babies. We begin to set our standard. There is something in us that says, this is the way how I want things to be done. Praise the Lord. And when our hearts be, be, we allow ourselves to become more and more offended. Offenses do not unrestrain our relationship with people, but offenses strain our relationship with God. Praise the Lord. But this is what Jesus has said here. Jesus is saying that it is impossible that offenses will come. Woe unto that person who brings the offenses. First of all, woe unto the person who has brought the offense. But when you leave the person who has brought the offense, then the Bible, Jesus gives the instruction to you who has been offended. After saying the judgment, it would be better for that person, a millstone to be, huh, to be put on his neck and then be thrown into the sea. And then he gives you the, the instruction to you who has been offended. He says, take heed to yourself. That means be careful. If your brother, your brother will surely offend you. Your wife will surely offend you. Your husband will surely offend you. But the Bible is saying, take heed to yourself. If your brother trespass against you, 
rebuke him. And if he repent, forgive him. And if he trespass against you seven times in a day, and seven times in the day, he still comes and says, I am sorry. What does the Bible say? The Bible is saying, forgive that person. You're saying I should forgive this person seven times in a day? You're doing the same thing seven times in the day. And every time you say it, um, you say, I'm sorry, and I have got to forgive you. Now that is the standard that Jesus is setting for us. He says that you are in the world of an imperfect people. You are in the world where people don't understand your standards. You are in the world where people are going to do things you do not expect. But when they do such things, speak to them. Not rebuking in the carnal way, because when we think of rebuking, then we may think maybe I have to speak roughly. No, because the Bible has already told us when you are offended, don't allow, don't speak in anger. That means even the way you rebuke, you must rebuke in love. You must rebuke in humility. You must set your case before your brother in a humble way and in a loving way. And he's saying, when you set your case and you tell that person, I don't want this thing. When you did it, I felt bad. And he said, oh, I'm sorry. And then two hours afterwards, he does the same thing. And I told you I don't like that thing. I'm sorry. And then he does it again. You see the son, Jesus said, he comes seven times in the day. And the person is saying sorry. Jesus is saying, forgive that person. So what happens if I say, mm-mm. That the first thing we say when we don't want to forgive, we say, that is too much. I cannot bear it anymore. I can't take it anymore. So when it is too much, what do we do? We pull back. When it is too much and we say this person, it seems it will never change. He will never understand. Sometimes we give up even on the third time or the fourth time or even on the first time. And then what do we do? We pull back. Because if you're not even ready to address that which has hurt you, this is one of the problems we have. Someone is hurt and you tell them, you see someone has pulled back. It's beginning to raise up a wall between you and them. And then you're asking this person, have I done anything wrong? And he says, no. You've not done anything wrong. But when inside of him, he really knows you've done something wrong. And what has he decided to do? He has say, he decided to say, I'm going to ignore you. It is useless for me. You know, inside of you, there is a clamor. It is useless for me to tell you that even you have done it. Even when I, I tell you, you just continue to say sorry, sorry, and you don't change. It doesn't say all that, but it is inside of the heart. There is this kind of clamor, there is that grumbling, there is that quarreling, he's not even saying it, but you say, have I done anything wrong? And the person says, no. But he's been hurt. But if we don't settle it, let me tell you, that thing is not only straining my relationship with this person in the house, but what the enemy is targeting is that you will not advance in your fellowship with God. Because offenses grieve the Holy Spirit. When we are offended and we are not willing to deal with that which has offended us, we grieve the Holy Spirit. And if he convicts us and he tells you, go put things right, forgive that person, and you're not willing to forgive, what happens next? You quench, you, you, are, you start with grieving, and then you quench him. Now remember, the Holy Spirit alone, it is him who helps us to pray, because we do not know how to pray as we ought to pray because of our infirmities. And the only way in which we can build our relationship with God, draw the presence of God, is through prayer. Yet we don't know how to pray. And the one who helps me to pray, I have grieved him and I've quenched him. Why? Because I'm not willing to forgive. Remember when the, Jesus was teaching us in the Lord's Prayer. And he was teaching us to pray. You remember the word that says, forgive us our trespasses. As we forgive those who trespass against us. To son you have your no no be a fair for what son you have to no na. It's like you're saying, God, this is the standard. Forgive me for my trespasses, even as I forgive those who trespass against me. And Jesus said, if you do not forgive, then your father in heaven is also not going to forgive you. And Jesus told us something. 
If you have anything between you and your brother, and you're bringing your sacrifice before the Father, you're bringing your life before God on the altar, and you remember there is something between you and your husband, there is something between you and your sister, there is something between you and someone else, your brother in the church or your pastor, Jesus says, first put the sacrifice down. Leave the sacrifice there. First go back and reconcile with that person. First put the relationship with that person right. First sort things right. And then you come and then your sacrifice will be acceptable before the Lord. One of the things why we are bringing sacrifices before God even in our days. We offer ourselves as living sacrifices. And yet our sacrifices are not acceptable before God. is because we are holding offenses. There are people we have in our hearts, they did things that are not right, and then inside of us we are not willing to forgive. What we did, we just raised up a wall. Beloved, let me tell you, there are so many marriages today where people are staying together, but they have a wall. The only thing they communicate is about food and what to drink and all other stuff. They do things, but there is no more communion. The Bible says, if a man says he's in communion with God, but then he has no communion with his brother, that man is a liar. And the truth is not inside of him. If you say, me, all I want is God. I've, I've given up on people. I don't care anymore about God people. I'm going to seek my God alone. Mm -mm. The Bible says then if that is your attitude, you've come to that place, you don't want people and you say all I need is God, all I want is God. The Bible says you are a liar and the truth is not inside of you. Beloved, daily when we wake up, there are small, small things that irritate us. There are small, small things that make us offended. Someone says something in the way you don't want it to be said, what do you do? And you get offended. Let us see the scripture that is in James. James, let's go in the book of James. Just open your Bible and we go into the book of James and let us see what the Bible is saying here. The book of James. After Hebrews, you come to James. James chapter 4. This is what the Bible says. It says, James 4, 1 to 4. That's what we are going to read. The Bible says, from whence comes wars and fightings among you? Come they not, come they not hence even of your lusts that war in your members? From whence come wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence even of your lust that war in your members? You lust and have not. You kill and you desire to have and cannot obtain. You fight and war, yet you have not because you ask not. You ask and you receive not because you ask amiss that you may consume it upon your lusts. You adulterers and adulteresses, know you not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God, whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Praise the Lord. Look at this. James is speaking unto us and, and is telling us, why is there that there are wars among you? From where come the wars in your midst? From there, where do you have fightings in your midst? And he's saying, no, let me tell you, there is only, the only reason why there is fighting, the only reason why there are wars in your midst, in your families, in the churches, it is because of your lusts. It's because of your lust, the desires of your flesh. And he's saying, you lust and you don't have. You kill. When you lust and you don't get what you want, you kill. Beloved, we don't even just kill with, with, with guns. We don't even just kill people physically, but there is a spiritual killing. When you cut someone off, you're killing a part of that person. When you build a wall between the person you loved yesterday, you're killing that person. The Bible says we, 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 we beat one another. It's not even a physical beating. 
But there is a way how you can kill your wife. There is a way how you can kill your husband. There is a way how you can kill your children without a gun, without an atomic bomb. Just by building a wall against them. Just by raising up a wall. Why? Because you've been offended and you're not willing to settle it. Why? Because of the lust of our flesh. The Bible is saying the only way why we get offended is when we walk in the flesh. Every time we see wars, every time we see fightings in our midst, James is telling us this is nothing else but because of your lusts. And then we come to this place where he says, and then you come to God, you do not have because you do not pray. You don't have a good relationship with God because you're not asking for it. Sometimes when we say you don't have because you don't pray, maybe we think about I don't have a car. I don't have a house. But now we are talking about your relationship with God. You do not have that relationship with God. You do not have the intimate relationship with God because you're not asking for it. You're not praying for it. And when you ask and you pray for it, you do not receive it. Why? Because you're asking amiss. Can you imagine when you can say you're praying God to change someone else? God, I want you to touch that person. I want you to change my sister. I want you to change my brother's Lord. And why do you, the question comes, why do you want God to change that person? God, because I don't like the way they treat me. Mm-hmm. God, I don't want the way they talk to me. It's now about you. You are the center of everything. Beloved, let me tell you, self-centeredness, when we think that we are the center of the family, when we think we are the center of the world, when we think we are everything has to center around us, we have to be the focal point, we get offended. Even when we come before God and we are praying, we are praying self-centered prayers. I say God to change you because I want comfort. I'm telling God to change my children just for me, not for him, not for his glory. No, it is for me. So God, do it because I don't want this, the, these people, the way they talk to me. Do it, God, because I don't want the way they treat me. It's all about me. Praise the Lord. There is a scripture that I love so much. And it, it brings out this point so well. Second Timothy. Let's go to Second Timothy and look at the scripture. The Bible is talking about the last days. Second Timothy chapter 3. The Bible is talking about the offenses in, our, in, in the last days. Second Timothy chapter 3. And this is what the Bible says. Second Timothy chapter 3. The Bible says, we are reading from verse 1. This know also that in the last days, previous times shall come. Know this, that in the last days, troublesome times will come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves. That is the key. God is telling us, take heed of this. In the last days, know this, that in the last days, previous times shall come. There are going to be hard times. There are going to be days of trouble. There are going to be hard times. There are going to be times of suffering. But why are the last days? And it tells us in verse 2, because. This word for is the word because. And the Bible is saying there are going to be trouble sometime. There are going to be hard times. Why? Because men will be lovers of their own selves. Covetous, boasters. Proud, blasphemous, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truth breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, dis fierce despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof from such turn away. The key to all the things, the first thing that the Lord is showing us, which is in line with what James is telling us in James first 4. When you read James 4, James is saying that is selfishness. When you follow your own desires, when you are walking a life that is self-centered, 
It's all about you. You are the center of everything. When you walk in the life, when you're looking for self-gratification, all you want is to fulfill your desire. This is the covetousness. When you walk in the life of self-exaltation, thinking you have to be treated every time specially, you people have to respect you. People have to honor you. They have to put you first. God is saying, because of all the things, we walk in trouble. Offenses will surely come. Why? Because people are selfish. Previous times are going to come because people are lovers. Men shall be lovers of their own selves. The first thing that comes is loving myself. When I love myself, I exalt myself. When I love myself, I'm going to walk in, in self-gratification. When I love myself, I'm going to walk in self-centeredness. When I love myself, I make a God. I become my own God. And because I worship myself and I exalt myself, I expect everyone around me to exalt me, to worship me, to treat me the same way how I treat myself. And if anyone does not do all the things for me, then what happens? I'm hungry with you. I'm frustrated with you. Praise the Lord. I was thinking of something. And I was like, what are the things that really make us to get offended? The first thing that the Bible is telling us here, that, Gem that 2 Timothy chapter 3 is telling us, it is about love. When you go in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5, what does the Bible say? 1 Corinthians 13, this is the chapter of love. And what does the Bible say? The Lord is saying, this chapter is talking about love. But 13.5 says, Love does not behave itself unseemingly. Love does not seek her own. Is not easily provoked and thinketh no evil. Love does not behave itself unseemingly. Love is, does not seek its own and it is not easily provoked. It does not think evil. In, chapter, in, in verse 4, the Bible says, Charity suffers long char and is kind. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself and is not puffed up. When you look, maybe in your own time, when you go back and then you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 13, if anyone is walking in love, he will not be easily offended. When anyone is walking in love, love is the power that helps us to forgive even people who do not deserve forgiveness. When we talk about the fruit of the Holy Spirit, the fruit of the Holy Spirit is not fruits, but it is love. Love is the fruit of the Holy Spirit. When we walk in love, when we have this fruit, we are patient. We are not easily angered. We don't seek our own. Love lays down its, its life for others. Beloved, the only reason why I find it hard to forgive someone who has offended me. It's just because of one thing. Love. And every time we get the things that irritate us. Every time things come. When people walk contrary to what we desire. When people walk contrary to our standards. When people do things that provoke us. There is only one thing that is being tested in your love. How, in your heart. How much love do you have? First of all. How much do you love God? And then the second thing is, how, do you how much do you love your neighbor? Beloved, this is just a measure of love. It is just all the shakings that come in our families, all the shakings that come in our churches, they only come to awaken us and to say, eh, eh, check your love. How much do you really have? Many times when people, we get new friends, we are so excited about these new friends. We talk, we do things, and then we share. But let me tell you, when you are in friendship with me, 
or you get a new friend and then you begin to tell that person I love you so much we so easily put the things on the whatsapp I love you so much on facebook I love you so much you text this person I love you so much and then we talk to one another on the phone and you tell that person how much you love them let me tell you that love is going to be tested there is no love that is not going to be tested. Even if it is love between a mother and her children, it will be tested. Be it a love between the husband and wife, that love is going to be tested. Be it a love between you and your neighbor, a love between, the peop between you and the people in the church, it is going to be tested. The moment you declare you love me, the moment you say you love me and then we say we are going to love in this love we easily begin to speak to one another and we feel the passion of love then time comes and God says okay let the love be tested how genuine is your love for me how genuine is that love for your neighbor and then you're going to begin to see things this person begins to do, to do things which irritate you this person begins to do something you tell them I don't want that thing to be done he says I'm sorry does it the next day he says I'm sorry does it the next day and then you tell this person I'm tired of you just saying sorry but the Bible said it when your brother says sorry forgive him if he says sorry in the day seven times forgive that person praise the Lord beloved let me tell you one of the things that is too hard it is forgiving but why is forgiving so hard when Jesus is telling us I should forgive even seven times in the day when you're doing the same thing? The issue is one thing, love. Love will determine the depth and the, and the, and, and the authenticity of my forgiving. My love for you will determine how much I forgive you. There are moments have you ever been in a place and you feel you love someone and you do everything for that person and you sacrifice everything for that person and what you expect is this person will understand how much I love them you give them the gifts and then a time comes when you need something from that person a time comes I mean because you've been you, you thought you've done everything for this person and what do you expect you expect those persons should also lay down their lives for you you expect they also make sacrifices for you and the time comes when you expect that person to do something for you and they don't do it what happens you get offended and say I don't understand people out of all the things that I've done for them I did this and then you begin to count I did this and I did this and I did this and I did this and this is the way how he has paid me you did whatever you did selfishly because the Bible said when you do good say I'm another servant when I give you something I don't expect to get anything from you love does not expect anything back when I give you something I don't expect you to give it to me back I give it to you if you give it back to me good but if you don't give it back to me I don't get offended I'll still continue to do the right thing but how many times I remember one time I was with one of my friends and then these people are married and I was in their home and this is a couple that I looked unto I had never seen these people quarrel I had never seen these people speak back to one another I mean all I was with them for more than a year but let me tell you the first year I was like I know, but I think these people knew how to, to resolve their things in their bedroom because I never saw anything like that and then one time I come I wake up in the morning and then I find the lady she's on the on the dining table and then she is crying and I felt concerned and I sat with her and I was telling her what has happened to you what is happening and she's crying deeply and then she begins to open her heart and she begins to tell me, this man does not understand me. I've done everything for him. I've sacrificed so much for his family. And then he begins to count everything I did. Da, 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 da. I've been doing this for his family. I've been doing this for his brothers. When his mother is like this, I do like this. But can you imagine when this has happened to my family and this is the way how he has acted? And she was, you know, you could, to the depth she sacrificed, to the depth she expected this man to, 
give a turn back. And when he didn't give the turn back, it was like she was pouring out such anger, such bitterness, such pain to the depth she loved, to the depth she sacrificed, now to the depth she was hurt. This man does not understand. She was, I think, I don't know if God helped her, but I believe she was coming to a place of like, I'm shutting up. I'm not going to do the same thing for, her, for his family as I've been doing. I'm also going to change the way I'm relating with his mother. I'm also going to change the way I'm relating. He doesn't care about my brothers as much as I care about his brothers. I mean, to me, first of all, before I began to feel sorry for what has happened, first of all, it was a shock to me. Because I thought this is a perfect relationship. I thought these people don't have anything. But when all the things were being poured out, I said, uh oh. So there is no perfect marriage. There is no perfect relationship. These people have their things, but they are deep inside there. And when one thing happens, maybe that day if I didn't wake up, I wouldn't have seen her crying. Maybe I wouldn't have known. There are people you look at and you think everything is well. But let me tell you, wherever two people are together in the same place, wherever two people are together in the same house, there will always be offenses. You speak in the way I don't speak. You speak, I believe, in my culture. My culture doesn't expect things to be done by the... So you are even contrary to, my, to, my, to, to what my culture told me. You're doing things not the way my mother said things to be done, should be done. And I believe in my mother. And because you're doing them that way, <clears throat> I close up. And let me tell you, the moment you really intentionally feel you have closed up for someone, you have put a stumbling block between you and your relationship with God. You have put a roadblock in, your, in the growth of your relationship with God. Why? You're not going to bring your sacrifice and it be acceptable before God when there is an offense with you. Beloved, we've been offended with our pastors. We have offenses in the church today. People are hungry with one another. We are in the same church. And people speak all kinds of words and you just know, mm -mm. The question is not what these people have done for you. Because you expected your pastor to pay much more attention in the situation you're in. And then the pastor didn't pay that attention. But you didn't even take time to know why did the pastor not give attention when you expected him to give attention. You expected me to respond the way you thought I have to respond. But I didn't respond like that. I, ex I, I responded in a different way. Because your way is not my way. We all respond to situations in different ways. And let me tell you today. Because of the quick communication. Because of the technology. Offenses have increased in our days. Because of the technology. It is good. As much as we can express one another, we love to one another in WhatsApp, love to one another on Facebook. But let me tell you, beloved, the technology has increased the offenses. Today, you, you have seen, I was on a WhatsApp group. Hallelujah. I was in a WhatsApp group where people from different and then we all have this group and then we all chat and then we talk. And you know. Someone brings in things and then he expects you have to give a praise. Someone thinks you have to give a comment. But let me first ask you, when you put something on the WhatsApp group and nobody comments, what do you, how do you feel? And then another person puts something there and everyone is flooding that and then they are commenting on it. How do you feel? Let me tell you something. I was on this WhatsApp group and then this person made a statement. And the other person made a statement and they didn't understand one another. And then everyone began to bring their comments on what was happening on the, on, 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 on the group. Everyone. And you know, at the end of the day, the group is divided. And I was in the window. You know the things we say someone is in the window. I was in the window and I was like, I'm not commenting on this situation. I began to see fire, atomic bombs on the WhatsApp, people hitting, arrows, da, da, da. I was like, mm-mm, I'm not responding in this situation. At the end of the day, in that very time, one, the person, these two have a conflict, and then all the others are showing me I'm on this side, I'm on the other side. And at the end of the day, the other person who was offended, because they had offended one another. And one of the people said, wrote on the Facebook, I mean on the platform of WhatsApp, said, if you don't want, I can even leave this platform right now. 
And then the other one said, what is the big thing? If you want to leave, you can leave. And the next thing was, the next message I saw, da 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 da, left. She left and she has never come back on that platform. Let me tell you, you someone somewhere, as much as we can feel the fellowship when we come on the group, as a WhatsApp group, as much as we feel the fellowship, it is easily, you know, we are coming from different cultures. What WhatsApp has done is bring someone from America, another person from Asia, another person from Uganda, someone from Nigeria, someone from South Africa. We all express ourselves differently. The way as a Ugandan I express may offend you, the Nigerian, on the same platform. The way the one in the UK, an Englishman expresses himself, it may offend me, the person who is here in Uganda. Praise the Lord. Sometimes you put something there and people totally ignore it and then you are offended because people don't comment on your videos. You put there something, it has excited you. So because it has excited you, you feel you, you even in Uganda here, people use their little MBs. I use my little MBs and I forward this video and I expect everyone is going to be excited as I am. And every time I look back, no one is commenting. What do you do in such a state? I remember, let me tell you, let me give you an experience. I have, I have an account on Facebook. And I put there my photos. I put there my, 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 my things. When I put there an idea and I put it there. And the time came. I don't know what happened. But something just clicked in me. To begin, when I put there something, I want to know how many people have liked my photo. How many people have commented on something that I've written on Facebook? And then I began to compare me with others. And there's a time when I said, when I'm putting some of the things on a Facebook, it takes me, I, I've prayed, and then I write some good idea. After I get a revelation, I put it on. And then I go on Facebook and I look at it, and only two people have put a like. And then I look at another post, someone has just put there a face. And he has 200 likes. Oh, what is this? Mm -hmm. I continued on things. Let me tell you something. One day I was so offended and I was like, I'm never going to put anything on this Facebook. These people, you know, like the way you begin to judge people, these people don't understand. How can you click on a plate of food and you're not clicking on this Bible verse that I put on Facebook? How can you not like how many of you have that problem? You put something on Facebook and you begin to say, how many likes do you have? It can even happen to us as preachers. You preach as someone like this and then it's put on the WhatsApp. It is put on the YouTube. The thing that you do every time you go to look on that message is like, how many likes are on it? How many comments are on it? And the moment people are not... When, when you find people not responding the way you wanted them to, res to respond, what happens to you? You shrink back. You begin to feel bad. Then you feel like these people don't understand. Or you say, I'm not even going to do it again. There are things today, beloved, because of the technology. People have seen people on WhatsApp. I was talking last time with my brother, and I think my brother was like, some people are even bringing bedroom. They are showing how beautiful their bedrooms are. Others are putting their kitchens and how the food they have cooked. That can offend you. But every, the other one is saying, I have a right to put on my platform whatever I want to put on. And then for you, your idea is, why should someone put a bedroom, his bed? Why should someone put his bathroom on? These people are just showing off. What is that? What are you thinking? You, I mean, you're now becoming self-centered. You, 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 you see it on the throne and then you think you've set a standard. So everyone has to follow your standard. What you can't put on Facebook, nobody should put it there. And whatever you put there, everyone should bow down. Let me tell you, when I began to get offended, when people, and I came to a decision, I'm not going to put anything here. Mm -mm. And then the Holy Spirit began to tell me, what is the purpose of your posts on Facebook? Why do, you, why do you put them on? And I had to sit down and examine myself. And I began to see how selfish I was. It was like I was self-promoting myself. 
It was like I was putting myself there. Let people see how wise I am. Let people see me. I put the phone and I'm like, okay, let people see. Can't you see this beauty? Can't you see this new attire? Can't you see my new style of the air? Please comment. And I began even to know people who don't comment. And I was like, God, I had to repent and say, God, I've been so selfish. And this thing is building so much selfishness in me. When I find there are 50 likes and the other one has 20, and I'm like, okay, this time it is me. And that is that kind of selfishness, self-promotion, and then the competition. Have you ever been there, and then both of you have put something on Facebook, and then someone tells you, you know, I have 200 likes, and you, 20. So what is someone is saying? They have liked. That is the truth. But the issue is, how is your heart responding? The post you put on Facebook, if you get so offended and you're so much about self-promotion, it's all about you. It may even hinder you to pray. It may even hinder you to read the Bible. Because you're offended. And some people are so selfish and they are so self-centered. They, they, they're like, they don't have the strength to put their, their photo on the Facebook. So when they see you putting it there, they're offended and saying you're also showing off. So we end up being in continuous conflict fulfilling the word that Jesus said offenses will surely come beloved I'm talking about this one of the things that Jesus is telling us selfishness James has told us in James 4 Jesus is telling us because of selfishness it hinders us to walk with God as Enoch walked with God Offenses are hindering us to come to that place of intimacy with God. Offenses are hindering us to seek God as we ought to seek Him. And let me tell you, offenses are good. Why? Because they are thermometers of your love. When you want to test your temperature, you have a thermometer. So offenses are thermometers. To test the temperature of your love. So when your love is tested. And then you find I've been forgiving you. But not this one time. Then get to know. Jesus never said that you come to a time when he said. He told Peter you should forgive seven times times seventy. And Peter said you know Lord. Increase our faith. What do you mean? I should forgive someone. Peter was like God if my brother offends me. How many times should I forgive him? Jesus said, I don't tell you seven times, but seven times, seventy in a day. What was Jesus pointing at? He was like, have perfect love. Forgive as your father's forgiven. Hold no grudge. Let nothing hurt you. Even when it hurts you, bring it out. Let's talk about it. And when we talk about it, let us forgive. One of the things, when you're selfish and you're self-centered, you're always going to interpret everything selfishly. When people do things, you always interpret and say, so this means. I may, you know, when we are here at the prayer mountain, we have so many people that are come on the prayer mountain. Someone can be here on the prayer mountain and his mind is focused on something. He bypasses you even without greeting you. And then you say, ah. I thought these pastors of the prayer mountain are really good. Even Pastor Richard Okanya can't bypass me and he has not greeted me. But you have judged it and then you begin even to avoid the man. But the issue is, by the time you met him, there was something on his mind and he was walking that he could not even notice the trees and the grass that was around him. And his mind was far. But because he didn't greet you, you got offended. And if you're offended and then he comes the next Friday on the pulpit and then he's preaching, you say, ah, those guys are hypocrites. They don't even greet people. They, he bypassed me the other time and now he's talking. No way. Do you see what? Because you're offended, now you cannot receive the blessing from him. You cannot be blessed by the person whom you've been offended by. And the devil knows that. He will cause you to be offended with, by the very vessel that God has put there to feed you. And if you're offended, then you close up your heart. A brother who is offended, the Bible says in, in Proverbs, is, it, it is harder to win an offended brother than a city with a strong buzz. 
What does the Bible say? When someone is offended, it becomes so strong. It becomes so strong that you cannot easily win that person. It's like you're confronting a city which has iron bars all around it. And if that happens to us, then what happens? It is going to be hard for us to build our relationship with God. So, when you are in love, you do not, you refuse to jump so easily to conclusions. There was something that Apostle John was telling us. You know, when things happen and then you say, so this means. When someone does something, when someone doesn't greet you and you say, so it means. When someone shares something and then he doesn't give you anything, so it means. So you run to a conclusion and it is not a good conclusion. If someone doesn't greet you by passes and you say, oh God, maybe he has a problem. Father, may you touch him. Father, may you comfort him. He could not even see me. Something must be wrong somewhere. You're thinking positive. But if you're in a person who is easily offended, you're selfish, your love is too little like this, you easily grumble, you easily mama. Why? Because you always come to selfish conclusions. When you call someone one, two, three times and they don't pick you, what happens to you? Do you say this person because it does? They don't care, it doesn't understand. What if you called my phone and I was in the bathroom? What if you called my phone and I was tending to my baby? But because I didn't pick and I called you back now, you also don't want to pick, let him see it. I called him three times. I called her three times and she didn't pick. I'm going to treat you. I will not answer her phone all this day. Why? You didn't even get to know the reason why I didn't answer. And I may be, not, I may be depressed. I may be in pain. That's the reason why I didn't respond to you. But because you're so self-centered, you don't care about the other person why they didn't answer, but you're caring about yourself, you are offended thinking, okay, they have to respond to you so quickly. Beloved, one of the things that is hindering us to walk in the way that God wants us to walk in, to walk with God just like Enoch walked, is this thing. We are offended the Holy Spirit was ministering to me and he was telling me this is an angry generation people are so bitter we are a generation of people who have lost selfishness they are bitter people are complaining about their presidents people easily slander their, their, their cabinet I mean they have a right they speak anything they want to speak and because there is this, is, this gorgeous technology, people easily pass over. They are poison to you on WhatsApp, on Facebook, and you also line with them. We are in a generation that has been corrupted because of offenses. Our sacrifices are no longer acceptable before God. I want us to stop here. We shall continue. With what can we really do to overcome offenses? And let us examine ourselves and say, is there any offense inside of me? Is there anyone that I'm angry with? Is there someone whose presence irritates me? Is there someone that I've not forgiven? Am I walking in self-centeredness, self-justification? In the last days, Prelious times shall come because men shall be lovers of themselves. I just want us to talk to God. And I want you to pray as you pray for yourself. Let us pray that God, I don't want to be part of this generation. I don't want to be caught up with the veil of selfishness. Because people are doing everything they are doing today because they are, fellowship, they are, they are selfish. Every situation you're going through right now, be it in your marriage, your relationship with your children or your neighbor or even people in church, the issue is one, your love is being tested. How much do you really love? And if you feel you're lacking in love, God is not judging you, but he's only saying it's time for you to get deeper in love. It's time for you to tell him, you know, Father, pour more of your love inside of me that I will love the way you love. Because if I hate my brother, then I cannot say that I love you. I cannot say I have fellowship with God when I don't have fellowship with my brother. 
These are things in the physical that are clearly said in the scripture that show us where we are in the spiritual realm. You are in a home. You cannot greet your wife. You can no longer talk, look in one another's face. And then you still say, me, I seek God. I'm looking unto my God. The Bible says if you're not a man, if you're, you don't have wisdom, your prayers are going to be hindered. Praise the Lord. This is the debt that we have. It's a debt of love. If you love me, you'll forgive me seven times, seven times a day. If you, forg if you love me, you will not hold anything against me because you're not seeking your own. But the more I offend you, the more I irritate you, the more I anger you, the more compassion you're going to have upon me. Why? Because you're walking in love. Let us pray. Father, we give you praise and glory. For in a such time like this, Father, you're calling us unto yourself. You're calling us into intimacy to come to a place that Enoch came to, that Enoch walked with you and he disappeared. Father, there is no way how we can walk with you when we have failed, my God, oh, Father, to walk with our neighbors, to walk with our children. Relationships are so strained that your word has come to pass, really, Father. As it is written in 2 Timothy chapter 3, that in the last days, prettiest times shall come. Because men will be lovers of themselves. Father, there are previous dark times in our, in our marriages. There are troubles everywhere. We cannot be on the altar. Because even when we come on the altar, everything is so empty, Lord. But just because of one thing, we've been offended. There is anger inside of us. We are not willing to humble ourselves and to release one another or put things right. Father, forgive us. This is a time, my God, oh Father, for us to be reconciled to one another, that we will be reconciled unto you. There is no way we can bring our sacrifices and they are acceptable before you until, my God, oh Father, when we go and put things right. Even right now, Lord, I ask you, may you open our eyes, my loving God, oh Father. The things that we've done, my God, oh Father, and they have offended others, help us to put things right, Father. The way we misunderstood people and we came to conclusions, my loving God, oh Father, and the people whom you put there to bless us, now they have become fountains of cursing. We cannot relate with them. We cannot look them in the eyes. And we are standing in the way of our blessing. Some people are even offended with their pastors. Others, they are offended with the elders in the church. Lord, this is holding us back to walk with you as Enoch walked with you. A senior pastor who cannot look in the eyes of the assistant pastor. They are offended because the assistant pastor was given a car and then the senior pastor was given a bicycle. The relationship is strained because of the gifts. Father, we need to put things right. And now this is the time for us to be delivered from this selfishness. Deliver us from self-centeredness. Deliver us from self-gratification. Deliver us from self-exaltation because your word has said in James 4 that this is the reason why there are wars in our midst, Father. This is the reason why there are fightings in our midst to the point we are killing one another spiritually because we have built wars all around us and we are daily making these walls stronger and stronger. The brick walls are becoming stony walls. The stony walls are turning into iron walls. The iron walls are now turning into bronzen walls. Father, help us and be gracious unto us. Help us to be the first one to humble ourselves even if we know that we were right. You did it. You were right and we were wrong. But we didn't come to you to ask for forgiveness. You came down to us and you told us I've forgiven you. Lord, help us even in cases when we think we are right, we are justified. We were the ones who were wounded. We were the ones whom they did wrong to, Father. Help us to humble ourselves and accept and take the place that you took. Help us to do it for your name's sake, Lord. Help us to let down our lives, my loving God of oh Father. You said in your word, you restore the hearts of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to the fathers before the great day of the Lord. We are in the days of perfection, loving God of oh Father. Fathers cannot talk to their children. Children cannot talk to their fathers. Family relationships are strained. The fathers are complaining about their children. The children are complaining about their fathers. Father, we cannot continue in such an atmosphere and think that we are going to see your glory. 
Lord, we ask you, help us as the mothers, the fathers, to humble ourselves, forgive our children and seek reconciliation. Help us who think we are strong to reach out to those who are weak. People we cannot even talk to anymore. People who pick, call their phones and even our heart says, Twa. Lord, you know the things, Father. But we are asking you, have mercy upon us, Lord. Some phones we look at it and then we even, and anger begins, the fire of bitterness begins to burn inside of us. Lord, help us to reconcile with our children. Help us to reconcile with our brethren in the church. Help our the senior pastors to reconcile with their junior pastors. Ministers in the church. Because of the spirit of competition. We have been seeking our own in self settledness Father. And we have offended one another. Lord, be gracious. Be merciful unto us. Deliver us from the spirit of selfishness. Deliver us from self-gratification. We shall no more seek our own, but we shall seek your glory. The time has come for us to walk with you. The time has come for us to glorify you. The time has come for us to be known that we are the children of God. Father, the time has come for us to walk in love. Love is not easily offended, does not seek its own. I ask you, Father, as you promised in Romans 5, that you pour your love upon our hearts. To us, Father, who feel inadequate, for us, my God, who feel that we don't measure up to your love, may you, my God, as we call unto you, as I will seek you, may you pour your love upon our hearts. That as you have loved us, we shall love one another. We shall forgive and build no walls. Have your way in us. We give you praise. We give you glory. And we give you honor. Because you have chosen us and we didn't choose you. May your will be done in our lives. Your name be glorified, Abba Father, in the mighty name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, we pray with thanksgiving. And all the saints say, Amen. Bind us together, Lord, bind.